right, so today I'm going to talk about transformative understanding and authenticity, subjectivity, knowledge, and ecstasy, or as I like to call it, aka ASK at first and DNA at SPT. So, let's start off with a little bit of a disclaimer. Tony and I have been running various studies where we try and increase people's understanding in order to get them to change some fundamental character high identification, things like individuality, individualism, versus, yeah, versus communitarianism, things like how they react to emotions, use scales like the test. And you might think that small manipulation to people's understanding couldn't make big substance into character changes. You would be totally correct. Uh, that's sort of a new pan out. So, I was talking to Lily, and she said, I could give you those results, but they're all pretty boring. But as it happens, I'm a normative epistemologist. So just to break up some of the data talks, this is going to be a straightforward normative epistemology talk. Um, now, if you do want to know how to run a study on climate change that doesn't affect people's character, I am definitely the person to talk to. <laughs> so let's start off just with an example to get a feel for what we mean by authenticity. So case one, Jim has been a nurse for 20 years. He has extensive experience dealing with patients and has decided he would be somewhat happier as a doctor. So Jim becomes a doctor. Uh, I'll address uh, Case two. Uh, John's mother is always right, or near enough, as makes no difference. This is like the Oracle case from an earlier talk. And she tells him he should become a doctor. He doesn't want to become a doctor. He wants to be a dancer. But he knows his mother is always right, so he becomes a doctor. Now, as has come out already in Fire's talk and in a couple others, John seems to be missing something in that his decision is somehow not really true to his present self. It's alien to him. Now, in more recent work, um, Laurie suggested that maybe what John's missing is something like responsiveness to the right kind of reasons, in the same way we would say that someone who just does whatever their moral authority tells them without actually understanding morality is missing a very important component from morality. So here's the project. Uh, main question. Here's the big question. What sort of connection do we need to have to a type of experience in order to be able to properly decide to have another experience of that type? And when can we authentically decide to pursue another hit of an illicit drug? Yes, it is another drug. Um, this is what happens when you let human people convert me speaking. <laughs> now, one thing I really want to emphasize right away, and this will come up again a couple more times, is that this is either a normative question. What makes it the right sort of decision? What makes you properly able to make these decisions? So these aren't the descriptive questions that we try to look at with our empirical stuff. These are, once again, straightforward normative epistemology. Um, OK, so what do we need to make a decision on our own? Well, it needs to be authentic, but there's sort of a label that we don't know much about. Um, now, you might think perhaps the information needs to be access through something like a subjective mode of presentation. You have to know it applies to how it applies to you from your own experience. Um, an analogy here is when, and many of you I'm sure are familiar, when a woman is raised in a black and white room, and then she walks out, she sees red for the first time, what has she learned? And the thought is that she always knew that roses were red, but now she knows it from a different type of presentation, the information she can access in a different way. So maybe that's what we need for a decision to be authentic. We need to be able to access the qualitative nature of the potential experience from a subjective standpoint. So, how, but what form does that access take? So here's what I'm going to introduce as the ASK hypothesis, or ASK, Authentic Subjectively Presented Knowledge Hypothesis. I'm just going to read this off to make sure I get it right. So we are in a position to make an authentic decision to pursue a type of experience when and only when we know what that experience will be like on the basis of subjectively presented, i.e. first personal knowledge. And I think this is in the background of a lot of what people have had to say. Uh, I don't know anyone's about it specifically, um, but it's common to the way people talk that in this literature that you can make these decisions authentically when you know what something is like. And other times people talk about understanding. So at, all I'm really interested in in this talk is epistemological groundkeeping. What happens when knowledge and understanding come apart? Which wins? So John can't make an authentic decision because his knowledge of what it is like to be a doctor is third personal, not presented subjectively. So that seems like a problem on either. 
but he doesn't know and he doesn't understand. If, uh, by contrast, he did know, a la Jim, he should be able to make an authentic decision. But in the same way that we're in a position to decide whether to have a second child after we have a first, so I'll return to that very briefly later. So here's a spoiler alert. Uh, I'm going to argue that the key to authentic decision making is not first personal subjectively presented knowledge, but instead some sort of understanding. That understanding is doing all the heavy lifting here. Uh, now, obvious question, what do these things mean? So, epistemologists have a pretty good sense of knowledge. It's something like justified, safe, true belief. Those of you who know your cases, those, those aren't there. Um, you can do other things like uh, those of you who know Williamson's account. <laughs> Uh, just knowledge as the most active general. So plug that in here and everything I say will apply. What is understanding? Uh, that's about as far as we get. Okay, you <laughs> probably want a little more information. So here's my best guess. Uh, and I've talked about this elsewhere, we can do a little bit today. Um, it's something like a mental model that can be used in contextually relevant ways. Um, okay, so here's the dialectical problem. Typically, when we know what we've experienced, we also understand what we've experienced. So how do I pull apart? Which is what I think authenticity. Well, we're going to aim high. Very high. Um, so here's going to be the central argument of this talk. So and here's where the handout might be helpful, just because there are going to be a bunch of big parts. Um, if ASK were true, we'd be able to authentically pursue experiencing another MDMA star high. Uh, I'll say what MDMA star is in a moment. There's a suppressed part of this premise that be able to pursue it in the sorts of situations I describe. Um, so just take that as given, it's just fit in nicely. So premise two, if we were able, and this is where I really the main one in the paper, if we were able to pursue another MDMA star high, it would generally be possible to make authentic decisions regarding token experiences of a transformative type on the basis of testimony. If you can make this sort of decision on the basis of first personal knowledge, the testimony would be good enough. Or if you can make this decision in these sorts of cases, then testimony would normally be good enough. So what I'm going to conclude is that ASK wasn't true. Uh, all right, we'll start with the easy one. So it's not generally possible to make authentic decisions regarding public experiences of a transformative type on the basis of testimony. And this is just what the John case was supposed to show. Um, now, once again, if you want a fancy, more general argument, if we could make these sorts of decisions on the basis of testimony, then the problem of transformative decisions would be really easy. Just ask someone who's done it before. The problem isn't easy. We wouldn't be here if it was. So there must be something wrong with testimony as a source of information for authentic decision making. Now, you could reject three. Three, once again, being the claim that testimony isn't sufficient, or testimony is sometimes sufficient. Um, and there's actually pretty good reason for doing this. So social epistemologists of various stripes for the last 30 years have made arguments about how central testimony is to all of our thinking, uh, all of our justifications. If you think about something even as basic as like, I'm in Austin now, think about all the ways people could have deceived you if they had testified differently. Um, airlines could have told you you were going to Austin when you weren't. Um, the street signs could all be misleadingly placed. Um, so maybe if testimony is so cool, We've gone off on the wrong foot. There can be authentic decision making on the basis of testimony. Um, so once again, this is a normative claim about the proper way to make these decisions, not a descriptive claim about the actual cognitive mechanisms that are being employed. Um, so first of all, I think, um, I think this, this would invalidate the central argument, but it also gives up ASK. Because what this says is testimony is enough. But ASK was supposed to be a necessary and sufficient condition. That what you need is first personal experience, subjectively presented. And this gets rid of the uh, ASK as a necessary condition. All right, got a little harder. So when we have an MDMA star high, we also, we, if we can make these decisions in the sort of case I'm going to describe, then we can also make a decision on the basis of testimony. So, what is MDMA star? Well, it's a drug that induces a sense of euphoria and has the following features. Um, here's the important one. It is impossible to understand or model what the experience is like when not actually in its grips. How plausible is this? Well, this seems to be the case even for lesser pleasures. It's like really hard to picture exactly what pizza is like in a way when you're not eating it. And in fact, that's one of the reasons you choose to eat it again. Um, and this is probably why people work so hard for certain eyes. 
Um, now, it's hard to model something also when the scale is a critical component. You want to make a model airplane? Easy, make a small airplane. You want to make a black hole? Model black hole? Much trickier. Because you need some, because as soon as you make it small, you kind of miss the point. Um, and if you want to go all philosophy about this, you can imagine wacky cases where aliens come down and just like knock out the neurons on which, which make up the understanding every time you take the drug. But hopefully we won't have to go there to drop one through three. Uh, now the second, number two is evidential. It's supposed to be evidence for one. It is surprisingly difficult to even predict what you're going to do when you're in the grips of an MDMA star high. And we think this is plausible. It's actually not clear for MDMA, but for my magic drug, we can make it. Um, because I'm sure many of you are familiar with the hot cold empathy gap. People are shockingly bad at predicting what they'll do with the sake of drugs or all on drugs. And this is incredibly pervasive. Um, and even when they know that this will happen, they still make a mistake. It's like hot star as well. All right, now what is MDMA? This is ecstasy. Uh, creates a very strong sense of euphoria, which from first personal accounts, people say they really don't get except while they're having it. So I think it's a good candidate for MDMA star. Otherwise, it would have been very misleadingly named. So I think this will probably work. If you agree that MDMA has these properties, go with it. If not, just we made up the drug. Um, if people want later, uh, I can say why MDMA is closer than stuff like cocaine. Um, close enough. So here's a strategy for premise two. I'm going to bridge from a case of testimony to a case of personal knowledge, and show, and hopefully show that if you can make a if you can't make a decision in the first case, you're no better off in the third. All right. So we'll start with MDMA case one. Um, so Logan is told what the effects of MDMA will be when he takes it, but he has no first personal knowledge. This just seems like a pretty classic case of someone who can't make an authentic decision. He just doesn't has the right connection to the experience of what it's like. It doesn't have the right epistemic connection. All right, case number two, Lily. Can you wrong with the marsh references? Uh, Lily takes MDMA and then blacks out. She has been told what she herself did. So she sort of has first-person knowledge, and that it's about her first person. But it's not subjectively presented. And she doesn't seem any better off than Logan. The fact that she happens to be the topic of what she's being told doesn't actually get her any new information. So is her position any different from Logan's? I'm gonna say no. Um, last case, Veronica. Uh, Veronica takes MDMA, but she doesn't black out. She remembers the proposition that MDMA feels really, really good. But she can't actually make sense of her actions while on the MDMA. She can remember all the propositions about what she did and what her stated reasons were at the time, but she can't really get it. Uh, and she can't make good predictions about how she will behave the next time she's on MDMA. And what I want to say is that even though she took the MDMA herself, has subjectively presented information, and I'm going to argue in a second, knowledge, she, it's still alien to her. The experience of her own past has been, she's been alienated from. And so she's in no better position than Lily, who's in no better position than Logan. So uh, if Veronica could make an authentic decision, so could Lily, so could Logan. Um, but Logan only had testimony. So if he could have made an authentic decision, then testimony must be good enough. Um, and that's what we were about to prove. Last premise, if ASK were true, we'd be able to authentically pursue experiencing an MDMA star high. Well, we said that subjective knowledge was what was required. What proposition doesn't Veronica know? Uh, in fact, what doesn't she know from a subjective mode of presentation? When she's picturing how happy she was when she was on the MDMA. She pictures it like she's looking out for her own point of view. Um, so you might think you would go with something like objectual knowledge, for those of you epistemologists in the room. Um, I don't think that works. I think for time, we should, I don't know how I'm doing this um, that <coughs> is a little too strict. And the reason I think that's too strict is, I'll try and do this quickly, in the case of a religious conversion, um, if what's going to make you convert is something like God's love, objectual knowledge is just like knowing a person. Like, it's not a proposition, it's just an object you know. I think you don't have that in the case of a religious conversion. Because you don't know God's love. You know various propositions about it. And you, I'm going to argue, understand various propositions about it. But you don't seem to have objectual knowledge. And incidentally, this is also why I couldn't use psychedelics uh, for my example. Because in the case of psychedelics, uh, you don't necessarily have objectual knowledge of the experience, I think. The religious case is clear enough. So where do we go from here? Now I've argued ASK is a necessary and sufficient condition. 
that this first personal knowledge is all, all and only what you need. Now, but which you reject? The necessary was sufficient. Here's a reason to reject the sufficient. Um, just take the case of Veronica. If you just have the intuition that you can't make an authentic decision, then whether or not you accept the necessary condition, you've already given up on ASK as a sufficient condition. Now, here's a reason to give up on ASK as a necessary condition, that you need this first personal knowledge. Well, see all of social epistemology. Testimony is really cool. You can do lots of neat stuff with it. Why not this? So I think what I actually think, and this I haven't argued for, is that you should actually reject both. Uh, that knowledge isn't the key, so first personally presented or otherwise. Um, so a positive proposal. So, uh, the problem with Veronica is that she knows what it is like to take MDMA, but she doesn't understand. Um, what she lacks is a good picture, model, whatever you want to call it, which is the precise of the thing that I think you get from understanding. Um, and it's not just me, these are our understanding is how to research, research <coughs> epistemology, people like Anchorette, Bergen Khalifa, writing about what understanding is. It's usually involving having the right representation with something like the right kind of ability. Um, this is connected to David Lewis's account of what's going on in the case where the woman sees read for the first time, that he says what she gains is an ability. Um, and it seems like what Veronica lacks is something like an ability or, or the right picture. So here's a little more. Now, first of all, this might get us the unwanted possibility that it might be impossible to ever authentically decide whether to take another hit of MDMA because we just might not have the representational capacities to picture being high when we're not high, um, as evidenced by stuff like the hot cold empty gap. They might be wondering if this is a general condition on authentic decision making. Why would we have to go this long secure this route via MDMA? And the key is that understanding and knowledge usually go together. If you know what you did this morning, you understand what you did this morning. If you know why it's raining, you understand why it's raining. What we had to do was drive a wedge between the cases where one gained knowledge, but something blocked the understanding. Now, incidentally, my wife assures me that childbirth also works like this, that the animations didn't work, um, that she knows exactly what it felt like, but she definitely doesn't understand it anymore, as evidence by the fact that she agreed to do it again. Um, <laughs> I toyed with using that as my example, but I figured a man lecturing about how childbirth works would not go over well. <laughs> um, so empathy. Uh, how does this relate to empathy? Um, can we make an authentic decision when we understand but not empathize? At first, I want to say yes. There's, I know there's a lot of just my own views here, and if people have good ideas of how to get data, that would be awesome. So if we fully appreciate, I understand, I mean model, the causes and consequences of theism, we can make an authentic decision to go to the church or not to go to the church. Um, and I think this voids what uh, Lori elsewhere calls preference capture. This problem that what you want is going to be hijacked by your empathizing with a potential other. Now, can you fall in love without experiencing it? This goes back to Carter's point. I just added this right copy break. Um, I think he's right. I think you can't. I think the Gilbert style talk to the last woman on the speed dating will not be enough to make you fall in love. But what I also think is that that's not the question. The question was the normal one about how to make a normative decision. Should I marry this person? Best way to find out? Probably they are. Only way to find out? Not so clear. Um, if you have a sufficient understanding of her, you have a good enough model, you know what she's going to do, you know how your life's going to be, can you make an authentic decision? Well, you don't have the effective quality of the relationship, but you seem to have, I think, all the, to my intuition, maybe this is just the case we should just put on and check and see what happens, all the information you need to decide authentically whether or not you want to get married. Um, 